easier uh, for some organizations to actually tap into or help uh, their subscribers to tap into the business opportunities. So in our Kickstarter today, Uganda is seeking to explore business opportunities in DR Congo. Here to have these conversations with me is uh, Mr. John Walugembe, who's the Executive Director for the Federation of Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises. Good morning to you, John. Good morning and thank you for having me here this morning. You're most welcome. And we're also joined by Damali Sali, who have been wanting to have here with me uh, for a very long time. She is the Chief Program Officer with the Private Sector Foundation uh, Uganda that was founded in 1995. So they've been here and they've been very focal in terms of the private sector tapping into business. Good morning to you, Damali. Yeah, good morning, Priscilla. I'm very happy to be here. Nice to have you. you. Now, I'll start off with uh, Mr. John Walgembe here. We want to find out in regards to micro, small and medium enterprises mm -hmm. under the Federation mm -hmm. and regards to Congo. What mm -hmm. is your mandate as a federation towards mm. those that subscribe to the federation in tapping into regional trade? Okay. Firstly, the Federation of MSMEs is a non-profit uh, business association where the umbrella for all micro, small and medium-sized enterprises who represent uh, close to 734,000 micro, small and medium-sized businesses in over 20 clusters of the economy. We try to address the constraints that MSMEs face both at the policy level and also at the farm level uh, through offering a wide range of business women services, including help them, helping them to access markets. Now, the Congo market is extremely interesting because one, uh, Congo adds about 90 million people to the about 177 million people we now have within the ESC. So that's huge uh, potential. If you remove the barriers that have been there, the payment of a 50 US dollar visa fee and the other constraints that have been existing, it means that as a country, we are likely to benefit greatly. Uh, already the January trade figures show that as a country, we sold to the DRC uh, close to $74.3 million worth of goods compared to about 29 or so uh, in December 2021. This has actually surpassed our trade figures with Kenya, where we only export about we only where we only exported about 40.9 million dollars worth of goods and products uh, in January. So the Congo market is huge, and some of the products that we tend to sell to that market are ones that uh, our MSME is dealing. What are some of these products in particular? So we uh, we tend to export cement. Uh, we tend to export uh, iron uh, products, we tend to export palm oil, we tend to export baked uh, products, that's bread, all these kinds of things. We tend to export sugar, we tend to export rice. Now, uh, MSMEs are involved in all these uh, products and value chains to different extents, sometimes through transportation, sometimes through actual production, sometimes through value addition. So. We believe that there's a lot of potential as a country we should do more to ensure that we tap into this market. And as a federation, we are very keen. We've been running a program on supporting MSMEs to take advantage of the opportunities in the African continental free trade area. We so far supported 300 MSMEs. We hope to support more very soon. Mm -hmm. So we believe that the Congo market comes on board at a very uh, opportune time. Okay. For the country. All right. Speaking of opportune time, uh, we get to have Damali Sali here with the Private Sector Foundation Uganda. They are using this opportune time to have the Uganda DR Congo Business Summit. Uh, could you give us the details of why Uganda is organizing a business summit in the DR Congo? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. And uh, maybe I could start off with a bit of context. While the DRC has joined the East African community recently, we have been trading with the DRC because of our historical ties, the fact that we are neighbors. Our, the tribes that are in DRC on the eastern side are also the same tribes that are in Uganda, all the way from Aroa down to Katuna. So it's the same tribes. Our DRC also uses the same, the eastern part uses uh, MTN and Airtel using masks that are actually inside Uganda. We share Lake Albert, we share Renzori, we share Bwindi. So we have already socioeconomic ties with the DRC. The difference is that now the DRC part, being part of the East African community is that it will ease the flow of goods because there will be less stringent uh, rules against our goods. So it's an opportune time for us to actually now do this business summit. In fact, what we are doing is that um, uh, the private sector foundation being the lead uh, apex body in the private sector 
Electorate in Uganda has uh, organized its sister we could say it's called the Federation of Enterprises in the DRC, so that there is a business-to-business -business networking, so that our Ugandan businesses can go and network with the businesses in the DRC to uh, engage on how can we enter this market, how can we join venture, how do we distribute our goods, is it easy, can I partner with you so that you can distribute my goods. This uh, business summit is going to happen from the 30th of May to the 7th of, uh, of, of June, and it will be in the town of Kinshasa and Goma. So they are going to be to two towns. And the impact, and uh, uh, well, Gembe was talking about it, Kinshasa has 20 million people. Uganda, our entire population is 45. Mm -hmm. That goes to show you the opportunity. And because of that, that's why the government of Uganda is now doing roads inter inside the DRC. And uh, to give you also context on the um, magnitude of potential opportunity of the DRC is that uh, last financial year from July 2020 to June 2021, Uganda exported over 516 million dollars worth of goods to the DRC. This is despite the fact that we are in COVID, we're in the middle of lockdowns. And if we took, if we look at uh, what happened when South Sudan entered uh, the East African community to us, our trade almost quadrupled with South Sudan. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look at these numbers, half a billion dollars with the DRC, if these numbers quadruple to two billion dollars, that's the potential we're talking okay, about. Okay, all right. And what's the time frame of this expansion, <laughs> especially the numbers uh, mm. from uh, half a billion mm. to two billion? I think with South Sudan, it took about two to three years to quadruple. Okay. So that's the time frame. But of course, you know, it, it, it depends. DRC, we could, we could, we, we must have learned some lessons from what we did when South Sudan entered. So we could now apply those lessons to, so that they are faster here. Uh, we're already doing roads inside DRC. We are now doing these business summits, which are, uh, um, private sector foundation is leading with the sister federation in the DR Congo. So it could be even faster. And uh, we are working also with uh, partnering with the government agencies, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Uganda Investment Authority, Ministry of Trade, uh, Uganda Manufacturers Association. And if we do these business engagements much more often, then it will help our business community to easily enter this, 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 uh, this market. And we could also use so many lessons that we learned with South Sudan. We had a lot of non-tariff barriers once South Sudan uh, opened up. But and there were a lot of engagements between the Ministry of Trade, Uganda, Ministry of Trade, equivalent Ministry of Trade of South Sudan. So these are collaborative and with private sector now taking, spearheading this initiative is to ensure that all these things work together so that we open up this market as fast as possible because of the potential. If Imagine if our manufacturers are able to quadruple their exports mm -hmm. volumes into DRC. The number of jobs that will be created here are immense value added tax will be a lot, uh, employment, and look at also these other services, transport and logistics. The goods don't go by themselves. You know, they're services that move the goods. That's transport and logistics. The people, if you think about, someone will have to now start doing marketing inside DRC or Kinshasa. If you uh, goes to Kinshasa now you have a distribution channel you have to do marketing you may have to take Ugandans there the good thing also is that Uganda Airlines uh, already has flights to Kinshasa so we could look maybe to, 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 to how many other towns can Uganda Airlines go to but uh, it's, 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 a, it's an absolute it's a, it's a low hanging fruit that we need to tap into with a with a lot of zeal because um, of the potential. Okay, all right. Uh, clearly, John here also needs to tap into that low hanging fruit that you mentioned of, and uh, with all the business opportunities that you seem to highlight uh, with this summit that is coming through the 20 million in uh, Kinshasa, uh, then also all these other incentives that probably let Road Network and others that have already in place uh, to support uh, the partnership that we have between us and dear Congo, especially trade wise, uh, from uh, the federal end of view while we're going into this business summit mm. uh, what do you desire be discussed on the table in terms of strengthening one uh, the human resource the trade in terms of goods and services especially mm. for the micro small and medium enterprises mm. okay first of all we have to have um, I think what PSF is doing is very good because it should be the start of a practice that will link both um, business communities because that's the only way you're able to trade. The other issue that I need to raise is the issue of language. You know, yes, DRS is joining and stuff, but our colleagues speak French. Uh, we speak English. But o there's the, the trade that language has not ar around East no, no, Africa no. being <laughs> no, no, Swahili. That, that, that has not been a very big hindrance okay. in the past. But I think it's also important as a country, as you prepare, that uh, we start coming up to speed. Yes, Swahili helps, particularly as you're 
dealing cost border trade because a lot of our trade also with the DRC has been uh, informal and conducted by cross border traders. Now we want to up it a bit to ensure that we are able to tap into the real opportunities. And uh, as Damali mentioned here, uh, the commitment by our government to make the roads, I think, is very important. Right now, government is working on three roads. It's working on uh, an 80-kilometer stretch to Beni, working on another road from Beni to Butebo, working on another road from Bunagana to Goma. So that's very critical, particularly in opening up the east uh, of the country. Now, as from, from the MSME side, there are about three issues that we think ought to be addressed. She highlighted the issue of non-tariff barriers. That's one. Sometimes on our side, sometimes on their side. Sometimes our own officials and so on make it difficult for SMEs to trade across the board. So that's something that we, we have to look at and come up with a very clear monitoring mechanism, reporting, monitoring, and the ability to address these non-tariff barriers as and when they arise. The other issue that we should also think about is the issue of insecurity. And I'm glad that UPDF is there trying to stabilize the situation. And I think with the investment in the roads, it will also make it more difficult for some of these rebel groups to manage goal areas uh, like the Guinea. Uh, you bring in the conversation of insecurity just mm. in South Sudan over mm. the last uh, 365 days, we can mm. say. We've had insecurity issues, especially uh, when it comes to in, um, rebel groups that yeah. have uh, destabilized our trade, uh, mm. killing some of the Ugandans and mm. route trade to South Sudan. And mm. uh, by the time government comes through to respond to that, or the trade or internal affairs comes through to have some sort of lives in between the two governments, uh, it's been some lives lost later. It's been businesses put to a standstill. Uh, mm. Just last year we saw a truck standstill because they mm. were protesting the insecurity that was not in favor of the trade between the two countries. Um, through PSF, uh, you, you, how do you intend to actually address this in when we are having the business summit uh, regarding insecurity in Congo? Okay, and um, I, th it's, I feel that okay, the government has obviously taken the, the lead in ensuring that UPDF is in there to secure some of the routes, secure the areas where there are rebel groups. But I think with our spearheading this initiative, where we're working together with government agencies, we're working with Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Trade, the Ministry of Trade is the one that is really mandated to deal with NTBs, and then a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of course, government to government uh, discussions, and then we are also by the fact that we are going to Kinshasa, we're going to Goma, we are collaborating with the equivalent of PSFU in the DRC. We intend to leverage those networks, all of them, to ensure that our people are secure. Because without security, we actually can't trade. So we hope to leverage this, of course, learning from what has happened with South Sudan. And these, these engagements must be a lot more regular, because we've seen that, yes, six months could be peace and then the next minute there's no peace someone's truck is uh, is confiscated someone dies so these engagements have to be a whole lot more regular and it's something that as private sector foundation is something we're intending to do because of given the lessons we love with south sudan but then given how big the, in, the the potential market the drc is that's why as soon as the DRC has joined the East African community. You can see that we are pushing to actually go and hold a business summit in the major towns and have these engagements as private sector uh, kind of leading and engaging. That way it will give us the leverage at, at this uh, business to business level. The private sector in Kinshasa will also be advocating for us. The private sector in the DRC general will be ad advocating for us. So if you have any issues, we can engage them at that level, but then also engage. Because as we go there, we are going with Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Trade, UN Investment Authority. They're also going to be meeting the equivalent partners in the DRC. So those are all layers of engagements, all layers of dialogue, which we all need to ensure that if any issues come up, which issues will come up, but that they are dealt with appropriately. Okay, all right. Uh, John also did make mention of uh, the language barrier and how it may potentially affect us getting deep into bed with mm -hmm. Dear Congo business-wise in Kinshasa, in Goma that you have mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, Francophone mm -hmm. communities versus English-speaking. Yes. How do you intend to actually address that in the summit? Is that on part of your talking points in the summit? It is. We're actually giving a, a detailed press briefing this morning at 10 here at Serena. I'm sure NTV is going to be there. Our CEO is going to give a, a lot of the details. But regarding
forgetting the language. It's uh, 50 50 percent of the Congolese speaks Swahili. It's one of their languages. But uh, when, what we've been able to leverage on has been that we are. And, and we trade a lot with the eastern part of the RC. Is that we are uh, we are we are the same tribe, so we tend to to deal with the local languages, especially around that. But it is true, in fact, that uh, DRC is francophone, so there is going to be a lot of translation. Um, uh, you know translating things from English to French and then back from French to English. So any uh, Ugandans who know French and English are going to be like in high demand. But it hasn't stopped us from doing business. The fact that they're Francophone and we are actually uh, English speaking as a language. So it hasn't stopped us. It's something that obviously we uh, we need to address a lot more. But it, it, it's not a hindrance that I see that will stop trade. Business is business. You can still be, uh, do business with someone who you speak a different language. We, that's why we've been able to do business with them in the entire past. That 500 $550 million, $560 million worth of stuff. We've been doing it despite the fact that they're francophone. But it's, 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 it's an area, of course, that we, we need to, 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 to tap, to look at, and see what we can do to unlock more. Okay, all right. Uh, John, under the Federation, as we are having this market uh, becoming formalized uh, mm -hmm. within not just Uganda, but also the East African community, you did make mention of that, the fact that we need to start formalizing uh, mm -hmm. certain things in terms of policy, formalizing in terms of reporting, monitoring. There's mm -hmm. also rules and procedures of trade that we have to now adhere to. Mm -hmm. And uh, under the Federation for microfinance, the small and medium enterprises, mm -hmm. what are some of those uh, formalizing procedures that you now must adapt to be able mm. to milk um, mm. that opportunity that we have with dear Congo mm. okay firstly we have a huge informal sector in this council we have a huge informal sector in this country and that's part of the reason as to why a lot of our trade with the DRC hitherto has been extremely um, informal through inform uh, informal cross-border mm. traders so Part of the intervention that the Federation has to do and part of what we are doing and in preparing uh, businesses for the AFCFTA is to ensure that they formalize. You as a business, you must be formal before you start thinking of trade. Because if you're an informal business and you're cheated in, in DRC, you're, you're going to, it's going to be rather difficult. The other issue is our members were complaining, particularly about the DRC market, was the fact that they are cheated a lot. When you say cheated a lot, break down that for us. Yeah, so you supply things, you discuss with this guy, you take things there, and then uh, when it comes to time for payment, the guy switches off his phone and relocates and things mm -hmm. of that sort. So this is, we must establish a mechanism, particularly as you're talking about uh, this summit, for dispute resolution between businesses. Because you're going to have situations where people disagree and, you know, uh, DRC is not as very low abiding, but in the east as as here. A member was telling us that you know you go and sell things to somebody, they give you the money, and then they connive with a local official to arrest you and then take the money away from you. Mm -hmm. So this is a very very serious concern, but on the MSME side, and I think uh, that this is something that summit should consider. How do we establish a dispute resolution mechanism? So if I supply goods uh, to a business in the DRC and I don't get paid, uh, how do I resolve it without necessarily having to go to courts of law in the DRC? I already mentioned the language issue and so on, so that would make things easier, particularly for small businesses. The other issue is that we also need to orient our small businesses with regard to the regulations in the DRC. Yes, it's good to comply here, it's good to get a QMAC from UNBS, it's good to get all these things, but what does the other market want from you? You know, now we've talked about big products. It means that people are running bakeries, small bakeries, can make a fortune. But what are the requirements? What are the standards? What are these? What are the labor laws and things of the sort? So I think after the high level summit now, it's good to go into the nitty gritties to prepare these businesses to take advantage of concrete things so that we are able to say after one year we've upped the trade and we, we've gone trade in particular sectors. Because even within these product lines, there are product lines that are dominated by big businesses. If you look at petroleum products, if you look at iron products, in those instances, SMEs can only be engaged in a value chain to deliver certain uh, portions of the value. Uh, however, there are those where SMEs will basically benefit and take the bulk of the value, and for us as the Federation, that would be the focus.
you know and that is where as a federation we would want to focus in order to build capacity mm -hmm. so i think that is something that ought to be done if we want to ensure that ISM is benefit and then finally let's also focus on those sectors where we have very many women and youth you know as a country we shouldn't just look at very broad figures and say yeah we are winning we should say okay let's interrogate those you know what 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 kind of uh, what, what, how much of that is attributable to our women entrepreneurs? How much of that is attributable to the young people? And how can we make that better? And that brings in the whole idea around digitalization. You know, how best do we ensure that we digitalize our transactions so that, you know, I don't have to move physically to Chisangani, to Beni, to where, in order to make a sale. Can I sell online and be sure that I'll be paid? Okay, yes. all right. Uh, Samali, then that makes you the, being the chief programs officer in this <laughs> regard, uh, he has measured very you know key points. One of them is business protection resolutions. He has talked about compliance and standardization, and of course, uh, looking into focal points or focal centered uh, uh, sectors uh, that are you know geared towards the youth and women empowerment. But uh, before you tackle those, what is Uganda actually taking to the DRC as a unique selling point? I think uh, if, if we look, we can immediately leverage what we've already been saying to DRC. This is cement, steel, uh, beverages, uh, soft drinks, uh, all the things. Actually, a lot of the gun and manufacture goods are going to the DRC, but in a way that is encumbered because the DRC was in part of the East African community. So they go there, but they struggle. You struggle with getting through the borders because you have to comply with new rules compared to Kenya where you don't have, com it's the same rules. When you get to DRC, you're complying with new rules. So you're gonna manufacture goods are the things that we've been exporting a lot to the DRC in the formal sector. Then the informal sector, which we're going to be talked about, that $560 million that I've talked about in those, those 12 months between June, July 2020 and June 2021, is 200 million dollars of that actually is on informal trade. On oh. informal trade, we are selling mostly fresh f stuff, beans, tomatoes, onions, that kind of stuff. That's what we're selling. And guess what? Who is involved a lot in informal trade? 70%, almost 75% of the people involved in informal cross-border trade are women and youth. Yes, they are women and youth mostly. But they also suffer a lot of these uh, issues. But they're contributing actually this huge amount of money. So they need to be catalyzed. And in terms of uh, dispute resolution, yes, that's a factor that has to be addressed uh, at the summit because we need to find a mechanism that is fast, efficient, and quick in terms of resolving dispute. Of course, these are going to be layered. The big dispute of the, you know, a, say, Emokwano, their trucks were going to DRC, they were confiscated, uh, you know, a truck driver is killed. Those are big macro ones. But mm -hmm. And, th and there has to be a resolution, a dispute resolution mechanism for that that is also quick, fast, efficient before someone loses their lives, before someone loses their goods. So we need to find a mechanism, a framework within which to do that quickly. But then how about this woman at Bunagana who is selling her tomatoes to the other side, who's f whose uh, uh, goods have been stolen, who is being sexually harassed, who is being, you know, physically harassed? What about her? And that goes to that the solution that uh, uh, Walgimbe has suggested. We need to figure out an e-commerce way within which to trade, not just actually with the borders with the DRC, because what's happening in, in, in informal trade with the borders with DRC is happening in informal trade with South Sudan, informal trade with uh, Kenya, informal trade with, uh, with uh, Tanzania and Rwanda. So we need to get an e-commerce platform that deals with actually informal trade, where we digitize everything. The lady in Bunagana who is selling her, you know, sack of tomatoes actually doesn't need to physically go to the other side. She could sell, get her payment. We, uh, if you set up a simple system which can't recognize languages, I mean, you put your tomatoes there, they are this price in Uganda shillings. The person on the other end sees it in their language, in equivalent in their to their currency. Mm -hmm. They pay you, the conversion is done. Then you have someone doing the logistics mm -hmm. who takes the stuff there. That will actually increase a lot of uh, trade, informal trade, and in a way then you formalize it because we have sight of it. But most importantly, it will keep our people safe our and secure and therefore also even their good safe. So it means the payment is sorted out. So we need to figure out a, 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 an e-commerce platform that works for Uganda with an e-payments, they call it uh, instant payments, but also with a component of logistics so that the woman still, after I've got the payment, I still don't have to figure out how to go to DRC to take the goods. We can sort out that uh, also logistics component. So it's something that uh, hopefully if there are any smart Ugandans, clever Ugandans, it's something that they should definitely innovate and do because it has a huge potential and it can be applied not just with the 
borders with DRC can be applied to all our borders. And it also can also be replicated. What's happening at the borders in Uganda with its neighbors is happening across the entire African continent. Because, you know, these borders are sometimes imaginary. You have the same tribes across the borders. So you can develop this platform that can be replicated across the entire African continent. But also, in the meantime, we also, uh, uh, as he said, as we're discussing these big guys entering DRC, we also have, and their dispute uh, resolution mechanism, we also have to remember the informal traders who are contributing a lot to our economy. How do we also address those, their problems and their issues? Okay, all right. So we're getting, taking something to DR Congo. What are we go going to get from the DR Congo in terms of business opportunities trade? Uh, so the, when, when I was looking at the Bank of Uganda figures, we actually imported a lot of, um, we exported a lot of gold which was our biggest export, but we're refining a lot of uh, Congolese gold in Uganda because we do have refineries. So that's, I think, the main thing. But then also, uh, Congo is ridiculously rich in minerals. So we can't find a way to add value to those minerals because our, uh, the, the, the issue about manufacturing is that they need a stable electricity network. We have that still expensive but we have that so if we figure figure out a way to the last time that happened with yes. Kenya yes. we had shortage in Uganda it happened with Rwanda we still got shortage <laughs> in Uganda yes. if it happens in dear Congo how much shortage should Ugandans expect as a back for but we must have learned from these lessons mm -hmm. and hopefully our uh, electricity distributor has sorted out you know mitigation measures with that but uh, what I was trying to say is that uh, we can find a way to add value to the Congolese minerals because we can set up plants in Uganda because we have a generally much more stable business environment than they do and that's an advantage to us and we also have a stable electricity supply notwithstanding those those issues that mm -hmm. came up. So we could think of what can we add value to? What does uh, DRC have in terms of minerals, and it's so rich in minerals, and can we add value to some of those minerals? Can we then create jobs and then export? Okay, Damali. Uh, when we open these uh, sort of relations, uh, already we are grappling with a refugee influx because of the insecurity in the DR Congo. Now, isn't that going to potentially create a window for more Congolese to desire to actually cross the border mm -hmm. and uh, move to the Ugandan side, which then will infringe on service delivery for the nation? Actually, there have been so many studies that have shown that um, where, the, uh, where there is security, trade is catalyzed and that uh, so it's, it's almost a chicken and egg if you enable people to economically be involved in economic activities it there's less insecurity there is less need for them to become rebels because they're now engaged in an economic activity so actually opening up DRC what we are doing as a country where we are trying to create peace then trade it will enable them to see that I can actually trade instead of going to war, which, and I don't need to die <laughs> when I trade. So that actually creates more peace mm -hmm. because people are en economically engaged in these activities. If anything, it's supposed to help the DRC be more secure. The reason why it's not secure is that a lot of their minerals are just, you know, what is uh, developed is the, the mine and then the stuff is taken out. Then the people around that mine have absolutely not any any benefit out of it okay. so they are invo easily involved in uh, rebel activities but now if we we go in there and start engaging and there's more trade they'll be less inclined to be involved in well the, uh, John the way Damali sells it is very juicy but yes. uh, with the Federation the micro the small and medium enterprises it yes. may sound like a threat to their ears because mm. if you're opening opportunities a security environment for dear Congo then mm. they're attracted to move to this side uh, mm. which may infringe on your already existing enterprise prices that are trying to tap into their business uh, mm. by the Congolese coming in taking over mm. the businesses or taking charge of the you know cross-border trade I don't think that would worry us a lot the Congolese have been moving here anyway and but overall their movement here has tended to be positive you know they are they, they are they are good spenders so if you go to Arua <laughs> <laughs> most of the hotels and the so on you know it's a Congolese and you know they pay very well and uh, they want a good life, you know. So if you're able to offer that, then you're in business. Uganda has also been making a lot of money through what we call re-export, right? For cars, for these kinds of things. That, that's also a very uh, important business, particularly with a focus on uh, Eastern Congo. As she's mentioned, um, if you have more trade, there's less incentive uh, for insecurity. And part of the challenge that you've had in the East is that there's hardly been any viable economic activity. So a lot of work has been very much focused on uh, 
extracting uh, raw materials and then trying to sell them illegally. So if that is streamlined and we are able to harness the various natural resources that are in that part of that country, then it's a great benefit. For instance, if you look at um, cobalt, if you look at, she's mentioned gold, if you look at timber, we import a lot of uh, timber from there. So if we can structure that in order to spur our local uh, furniture cluster, because th th that, that is the other issue. Government now has made it difficult for people to just bring in imported furniture. But if we've now created a law that seeks to spur the local furniture sector, then we sh should make it easier for these businesses to access high quality raw materials and also support our businesses to get access to high quality technology so that they make high quality products. You know, the Congolese want a good life. If something is not good, they won't buy it. This is what people must understand. And you, because you must the get into the side, mind. It's the opposite. You <laughs> must get as into long as it's affordable, <laughs> the cheaper, the, the cheaper better. The better. You, so the you must get into the mind of the buyer. And I want to tell our SMEs on camera without any fear of contradiction. <laughs> the Congolese would want to spend so long as something is good. So this issue of trying to cut corners and making substandard products and saying that Congolese will have it, they won't have it. You just need to ensure that you are able to up your game in terms of the quality of the final product. You, you that goes across the board, really, yeah. because uh, Congolese rather stay in a hat, you know, but put on a gold watch, That's you know, true. or a, a whatever. So it means that as we are taking products, we must understand this side in terms of the quality. And secondly, we are competing with other countries. You know, Congo is doing a lot of trade with Belgium. A uh, lot, lot of trade with Rwanda. Actually, Rwanda has overtaken us in terms of exports to that country. See, so it means we are not there alone. No, we get the impression that Congo is there for taking. There's no one there, so we can afford to take anything, and it will be acceptable. No, we are competing with others, so we need to have that at the back of our mind. Okay, all right. Uh, Johnny, you've mentioned something very, mm. very key. Uh, you know mm. the. the the social structure of society is, is, mm. is different, and their appreciation for the finest in life uh, versus ours. Uh, but one of the challenges that we have had, especially with the micro, small, and medium enterprises, is the fact that they start off with the standard that is required and accepted and uh, awarded by the standardization boards. Then, after a year, two, three, that standard gets to drop. The quality of the product on the market gets to drop. How are you addressing this issue on the Ugandan side? Because, please, even if Congolese love a fine life, even Ugandans must be given the best. No, you, you know, part of the challenge, and we complain about you, our, our partners in the media. <laughs> Someone starts his business, he sits in the business, he gives it focus, it starts to do well. Then, today he's on NTV, uh, at morning at NTV. Tomorrow he's somewhere else. In the evening he's giving another speech. Meanwhile, people in the business are doing whatever they are doing. In the meantime, he's speaking awards, he's telling people how he has been able to succeed, and so on. Meanwhile, the, the actual quality of the product it's going down. And then you realize that, okay, this man will award the deal But as just a how, top do you, how do you blame that <laughs> on, on the media? <laughs> the it's not the media. media. We're here to bring light to, no, what, the to what the person Sometimes is doing. However, yeah. it's upon <laughs> that person, the systems that they have set up, are they still monitoring and evaluating the product that they started with? I think that's the actual problem that needs I to be agree. addressed by I the agree, but we also So what are some of those uh, you know, uh, things that you're doing to address the monitoring and evaluation to ensure standardization is all the I think that businesses. The so, uh, well, so, I'm trying to apportion blame here, but <laughs> <laughs> no, please keep it. The, <laughs> the, <laughs> the businesses should also do better, and that's why you need to invest in systems. You know, and we need to invest in systems because it's only a system that can guarantee that a product, a good product that you produce today, will be produced tomorrow. If you don't have a system, it means you have to be there in order to ensure that that happened. And it's not sustainable. So businesses have to appreciate that buildings, investing in systems, doing things right, going beyond the call of duty. Because just because you got a QMAC by UNBS, doesn't mean the customer will like it. 
Customer doesn't care about you in BA certification. Customer cares about what they want. You know? They look at the thing. If they don't like it, yeah. that is their standard. So I think as SMEs, as we do whatever we do, let's not just look at meeting the bare minimum. Let's make sure that we go beyond. And that's why I said, if you're doing stuff for Congolese and other people, just make it flashy, make it good. Make sure that when someone looks at it, they, they'll spend as much money as possible to have it. Chief this Programs Officer, thing. clearly there's an issue that we're going to be facing in the near future with this uh, you know, formalization of trade between DR Congo and Uganda. Uh, for the business summit that we're going to be having, Uganda, uh, Congo, uh, at the end of the month into June, how do you actually intend to address this challenge? I think uh, by we doing this business summit, and uh, as I mentioned, PSF is going to be doing more of this because we need more business to business networking, more business to business engagement. Now, when our private sector comes to this business summit, they are going to be engaging with the private sector in Congo. Then you get to understand the socioeconomic context, the, what their standards are, what their needs are. And then talking about this networking is critical because there should be relationships built. If our business people in Uganda create relationships with the Congolese, then, you know, when I'm your friend, I get to understand what your tests are. You get to tell me, but, oh, by the way, that doesn't fly. That phone won't sell in the DRC. It's not good enough. Or that would work, actually. So we have to create those relationships with the Congolese because that will help you. I would even encourage actually Ugandan businesses that wherever you can and it's, it's a good thing that Uganda actually hosts a lot of refugees because there are a lot of Congolese in Uganda so you can actually have a relationship with them and ask them what actually works in the DRC and then also at uh, the business summit that uh, private sector foundation is doing is that the private sector comes you start to understand the culture context the socio-economic context of the market you're trying to enter those are the analysis that you're going to do then you're going to determine am I going to join venture with another business here instead of me entering as my and setting up afresh when I could just join venture with someone and then I distribute my goods to them then they distribute them because they already know the context they already know the market they already know the language they already have their customer so they, I could just leverage that or could I set up a distribution channel or could I actually just set up a plant near the border between Uganda and DRC and then you know so those are the I, the, the viabilities that businesses are supposed to be looking at that's why we're doing this business summit where we businesses, Ugandan business, come meet the Congolese business people. Let them tell you context. Also tell them context, because it's a two-way. DRC has opened up, so have we. So they also, the Congolese businesses, want to know what's happening here. So it's a win-win, because they need something from you, you also need something from them. So you can't leverage that need, where I can be your distributor in Uganda, you can be my distributor in, in the Congo, and we're selling different products. But I leverage your distribution networks, your marketing, everything, while you do the same here. So that's, those are all business decisions, and that's why these networking, the business summits, are critical and important, and that's why PSFU is really taking these initiatives. And we're not only going to do them in DRC, we'll go to South Sudan, we'll go to Kenya. We had um, the High Excellency, uh, the President of, of of Tanzania recently here, she had come to meet uh, our president in Uganda, but we also had a business summit where Ugandan businesses met uh, the Tanzanian businesses. So this is something that, as PSFU, we intend to do because we need those networks. Okay, all right. Uh, having a wrap-up of this conversation, uh, John, uh, what are your expectations from the summit? What do you desire be tabled? No, I think the, uh, the expectations is that we shall start building those relationships within businesses. Let's not just give it at governmental level, you know, and I, I, I hope PSF has taken this into consideration because, you know, the other time we had a Dubai summit and three quarters of the participants were government officials. Oh, government officials. This is a disgrace. And I hope this is, because if we have a summit full of permanent secretaries and the LC5s and ministers, these guys don't care. They have never sold the pin. They wouldn't mind. They can say big things and then, and then, then nothing happens. So what we want a concrete business relationship being established and I'm sure the summit is good is in good hands All with right. uh, Thank Chief you. Programs <laughs> Officer, what's your commitment to the Ugandan business market ahead of this summit? I think the commitment is that as private sector foundation, we are committed to ensuring that we uh, nudge this relationship, that we as private sector foundation take the lead in ensuring that the needs of the private sector are addressed. And that's a critical role that has to happen. And I also encourage you to uh, tune into our press conference that's happening today at 10 a.m. at um, 
Serena, and I'm sure NTV is going to be there. Okay, all right. Well, thank you so much, Damali Sili and John Olgembe, uh, for this exposure on the trade between Uganda and DR Congo. Of course, compliance and standardization uh, must be key. But John mentioned something very interesting, that uh, our neighbors are lovers of the finest in the land, uh, something Ugandans we should adopt. Anyway, the finest in the land is still on morning at NTV, and we get to have another discussion in our tech note in which we're going to be looking at what you need to know about preeclampsia, which is a disease. Here to have that conversation with us is Dr. Dixon Kaya. To do stay with us.